100 Ways to Motivate Yourself, Change Your Life Forever Written by Steve Chandler Read by the author I hope what I'm about to say doesn't offend you, but you have no personality. That each of us has a fixed personality is a complete myth. We make ourselves up as we go along. Charlie Chaplin once entered a Charlie Chaplin look-alike contest in Monte Carlo, and the judges awarded him third place. The choices we make for our thinking either motivate us or they don't. And while clear visualization of a goal is a good first step to success in life, self-motivation demands more. To truly motivate yourself in the life you want to live, actions required. As psychologist and author Dr. Nathaniel Brandon has written, a goal without an action plan is a daydream. Self-creation happens once self-motivation is mastered. One flows directly from the other. Motion creates the self. In my experience as a teacher, consultant, and writer, I've accumulated a hundred ways of thinking that lead directly to self-motivation. I now present these thoughts to you. Number one, create a vision. Arnold Schwarzenegger was not well known in 1976 when he and I had lunch together at the Double Tree Inn in Tucson, Arizona. He was in town publicizing the movie Stay Hungry. It was a box office disappointment that he just made. I was a sports columnist for the Tucson Citizen and my assignment was to spend a full day one-on-one -on -one with Arnold and write a feature story about him. So at one point I casually asked him, now that you've retired from bodybuilding, what are you going to do next? And with a voice as calm as if he were telling me about some mundane travel plans, he said, I'm going to be the number one box office star in all of Hollywood. I tried not to show my shock and amusement at his plan. After all, his first attempt at movies didn't promise much. And his Austrian accent, an awkward, monstrous build, really didn't suggest instant acceptance by movie audiences. So I asked him just how he planned to become Hollywood's top star. It's the same process I used in bodybuilding, he explained. What you do is create a vision of who you want to be and then live into that picture as if it were already true. Now notice that Arnold said create a vision. He didn't say that you wait until you receive a vision. You create one. In other words, you can make it up. Number two, tell a true lie. Recently, my 12-year-old daughter participated in a poetry reading in which all her classmates had to write a so-called lie poem about how great they were. They were supposed to make up untruths about themselves that made them sound unbelievably wonderful. I realized that the children were doing what Arnold did to clarify the picture of his future. By lying to themselves, they were creating a vision of who they wanted to be. So if it's hard for you to imagine the potential in yourself, then you might want to start by beginning to express it as a fantasy, like the children did who wrote the poems. Think up some stories about who you'd like to be. Without a picture of your highest self, you can't live into that self. Number three, leave your comfort zone. Our society encourages us to seek comfort. And yet, only challenge will test our skills and make us better. Only challenge and the self-motivation to engage the challenge will really transform us. And every challenge we face creates a more skillful self. So it's up to you to constantly look for challenges to motivate yourself. And it's up to you to notice when you're buried alive in a comfort zone. Then break free and fly away. Number four, find your key. I used to have the feeling that everyone else in life had been issued an instruction book on how to make life work. And I, for some reason, wasn't there when they passed the books out. Still struggling in my mid-30s, with a pessimistic outlook and no sense of purpose, I voiced my frustration once to a friend of mine, Dr. Michael Killebrew. He recommended a book to me. The name of the book was The Master Key to Riches by Napoleon Hill. What the book actually did was a lot more than increase my earning capacity, although by practicing the principles in the book, my earnings did double in less than a year. 
Hill's advice ultimately sparked a fire in me that changed my entire attitude toward life. Without fully understanding it, I was engaging in the process of completely rebuilding my own thinking. I was, thought by thought, replacing the old cynical and passive orientation to life with a new optimistic and energetic attitude. So what was this master key to riches? Napoleon Hill tells us in his book, quote, The great master key to riches is nothing more or less than the self-discipline necessary to help you take full and complete possession of your own mind. Remember, it is profoundly significant that the only thing over which you have complete control is your own mental attitude. Maybe the Hill book won't be your own key, but I promise you that you'll find your own instruction book if you keep looking. You'll find it when you're ready to seek. It's out there, waiting for you. Number five, plan your work. Many of us think we're too depressed right now to start on a new course of self-creation, or we're too upset. But Napoleon Hill says that's the perfect time to learn life's most important rule. There is one unbeatable rule for the mastery of sorrows and disappointments, he says. And that's the transmutation of those emotional frustrations through definitely planned work. It's a rule which has no equal. Once we get the picture of who we want to be, definitely planned work is the path to self-motivation. Definitely planned work contains the energy of purpose. One hour of planning saves three hours of execution. Most of us don't take the time to plan for an hour. We don't understand that it'll be the most productive hour we spend. Instead, we wander into the workplace and react to crises. And ironically, most crises are a result of a failure to plan. Well, it is impossible to work passionately with a sense of purpose and feel depressed at the same time. Successfully planned work will motivate you to do more and more than you ever thought possible. Number six, move your goalposts. Most people are surprised to learn that the reason they're not getting what they want in life is because their major goals are too small and too vague and therefore have no power. Your major goal will not be reached if it fails to excite your imagination. What really increases motivation is the setting of a large and specific power goal. A power goal is a dream that drives you. People who have created power goals are living on purpose. They know what they're up to in life. How can you tell if you've got a big enough and real enough power goal? Simply observe the effect your goal has on you. It's not what a goal is that matters. It's what a goal does. Number seven, dribble with your other hand. If you've ever coached kids who play basketball, you know that most of them have a tendency to dribble with only one hand, the one attached to their dominant arm. When you notice a child doing this, you might call him aside and say, Hey, Billy, you're dribbling with one hand. The defender can easily defend you. Your options are cut off. You need to dribble with the other hand so that can't happen. At which point, Billy says, I can't. Billy... It's not that you can't, it's that you haven't. Then you explain to Billy that his other hand can dribble just as well if he logs enough bounces. It's just the simple formation of a habit. After enough practice dribbling with his other hand, Billy begins to learn you are right. And the same principle is true for reprogramming your own habits of thinking. Thinking is just like bouncing the ball. On the one hand, you can think pessimistically and build that side of you up. It's just a matter of repeating the bounces. On the other hand, you can think optimistically, one thought at a time, and build that side up. The overall pattern won't change after just a few positive bounces of the ball, but you do change, one thought at a time. Number eight, play your character. How you act is who you become. Consider these thoughts from Star Trek's Leonard Nimoy. Quote, Spock had a big, big effect on me. 
I'm so much more Spock-like today than when I first played the part in 1965 that you wouldn't recognize me. I'm not talking about appearance, but thought processes. Doing that character, I learned so much about rational, logical thought that it reshaped my life. Now, just like Spock, we, too, can gain energy and inspiration by doing the character we want to be. We can become who we act like we are. Number nine, don't just do something. Sit there. Sit quietly, absolutely alone, for a long time, all by yourself. Completely relax. Don't allow the television or music to distract you. Be with yourself. Observe insights starting to appear. Observe your relationship with yourself starting to get better. Sitting in silence allows your true dream in life to take shape and clarity. In modern, interactive, civilized life today, you're either living your dream or someone else's. And unless you give your dream the time and space it needs to express itself, you'll spend the better part of your life living the dreams of other people. Number 10. Use the right chemicals. Not real drugs, of course. Instead, get into those energizing chemicals already in your system that get activated when you laugh or sing or dance or run or hug someone. When you're having fun, your body chemistry changes and you get new surges of motivation and energy. Don't keep trying to go out searching for something that's fun. It's not out there anywhere. It's inside yourself. If you can't immediately see the fun in something, find a way to create it. Once you've made a job fun, you've solved the problem of self-motivation. Number 11. Leave high school. Most of us think we're stuck in high school forever. Before high school, in our earlier and more carefree childhoods, we were creative dreamers filled with a boundless sense of energy and wonder. But in high school, something got turned around. We began fearing what others were thinking of us. All of a sudden, our mission in life became not to be embarrassed. We were afraid to look bad, and so we made it a point not to take risks. Most people end up designing their lives based on what other people might be thinking of them. But we can leave that habit behind. As Emerson asked, why should the way I feel depend on the thoughts in someone else's head? Number 12. Lose face. You can create a self that doesn't care that much what people think. You can motivate yourself by leaving the painful self-consciousness of high school behind. The actor René Aubergenois said, Show me a guy who's afraid to look bad, and I'll show you a guy you can beat every time. Number 13. Sing without feeling. Become a performer. Act like you already feel like you want to feel. American philosopher William James put it very clearly. We do not sing because we are happy. We're happy because we sing. If you want to be happy, find the happiest song you know and sing it. It works. Number 14. Kill your television. If you're watching too much television and you know it, you might find it useful to ask this one question. Which side of the glass do I want to live on? When you're watching television, you're watching other people do what they love doing for a living. Those people are on the best side of the glass because they're having fun and you're passively watching them have fun. They're getting money and you're paying. Groucho Marx once said he found television very educational. Every time someone turns it on, he said, I go in the other room to read a book. Number 15. Read yourself a story. Abraham Lincoln used to drive his law partners crazy. Every morning, he'd come into the office and read the daily newspaper aloud to himself. Why did Abe do this morning reading aloud? He discovered that he remembered twice as much when he read aloud than when he read silently. And what he did remember, he remembered for a much longer period of time. Anytime you have an opportunity to read something that's important to you, try reading it aloud. 
See if you don't make twice the impression on yourself. Number 16. Get on your deathbed. Many of us, including myself, keep pretending that our game has no end. We plan to do great things someday when we feel like it. Confronting our own death doesn't have to wait until we run out of life. In fact, being able to vividly imagine our last hours on our deathbed creates a paradoxical sensation, the feeling of being born all over again. And that's the first step to self-motivation. Number 17. Be lazy to begin with. Henry Ford used to point out to his colleagues that there wasn't any job that couldn't be handled if they were willing to break it down into small pieces. And when you've broken a job down, remember to allow yourself some laziness in beginning. Because it isn't important how fast you're doing it. What's important is that you are doing it. The irony is, the slower you start something, the faster you'll be finished. When you first think about doing something hard and overwhelming, you're most aware of how you don't want to do it at all. In other words, the mental picture you have of the activity, doing it fast and furiously, is not a happy picture. So you think of ways to avoid doing the job altogether. Thinking about starting slowly is easy. And doing it slowly allows you to actually start doing it. Therefore, it gets finished. Number 18. Leave your friends. Politely walk away from so-called friends who don't support your goals. When you're in a conversation with a pessimist, possibilities seem to have a way of disappearing and a narrow sense of cynicism settles in. President Calvin Coolidge once said, Cynics do not create. Everyone knows that enthusiasm for life is contagious. And being in a conversation with an optimist opens us up to see more and more of life's possibilities. Number 19. Plan your game. Design your own life's game plan. Let the game respond to you rather than the other way around. Be like Bill Walsh, the former head coach of the San Francisco 49ers. Everybody thought he was a kind of eccentric because of how extensively he planned his plays in advance of each game. Most coaches would wait to see how the game unfolded, then respond with plays that seemed appropriate, not Bill Walsh. Walsh would pace the sidelines with a big sheet of plays that his team was going to run no matter what. He wanted the game to respond to him. Walsh won a lot of Super Bowls with his so-called eccentric, proactive approach. But all he did was to act on the crucial difference between creating and responding. Number 20. Find your inner Einstein. The next time you see a picture of Albert Einstein, realize that that's actually you. Every human has the capacity for genius. To experience Einstein's creative level of thinking, all you have to do is commit to using your imagination. You know, this is sometimes a difficult recommendation for grown-ups to follow. Grown-ups have become accustomed to using their imaginations for only one thing, worrying. Grown-ups visualize worst-case scenarios all day long. All their energy for visualization is channeled into colorful pictures of what could go wrong. Worry is a misuse of the imagination. What people don't comprehend is that the human imagination was designed for better things. People who use their imaginations to create often achieve things that worriers never dream of achieving, even if the worriers have much higher IQs. Dreaming is the design stage of creating the future. Imagine yourself living a motivated life. Number 21. Feel good first. Most people think they'll feel good once they reach some goal. They think happiness is out there somewhere. The problem with putting off feeling good about yourself until you hit a certain goal is that it might never happen. By linking happiness to something you don't have yet, you're denying your power to create it for yourself in the moment. Your happiness is your birthright. 
It shouldn't depend on your achieving something. Start by claiming it and using it to make your journey fun all the way and not just fun at the end. Number 22. Run toward your fear. The world's best kept secret is that on the other side of your fear, there's something safe and beneficial waiting for you. If you work through even a small fear, you'll increase the confidence you have in your ability to create your life. General George Patton said, Fear kills more people than death. Death kills us but once, and we usually don't even know it. But fear kills us over and over again, subtly at times and brutally at other times. The rush we get after running through the waterfall of fear is the most energizing feeling in the world. If you're ever in an under-motivated mood, find something you fear and do it, and watch what happens. Number 23. Just the unexpected. Most people don't see themselves as being creative, but we all are. And one of the reasons we don't see ourselves that way is that we normally associate being creative with being original. But creativity has nothing to do with originality, and it has everything to do with simply being unexpected. So if you're willing to accept that you are creative, you can begin to cultivate that side of yourself. You can start coming up with all kinds of unexpected solutions to the challenges that life throws at you. Number 24. Create your relationships. The Italian artist, Luciano de Crescenzo said, We are each of us angels with only one wing, so we can only fly embracing each other. And we can't create our truest selves without creating relationships in the process. Relationships are everywhere. In relationships, most of us think with our emotions, not our minds. But any time you take a relationship problem up into the mind, you have unlimited opportunities to get creative. Conversely, when you send a relationship problem down the elevator into the heart, the gut, you risk staying stuck in that problem forever. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't feel anything. Feel everything. Notice your feelings. But don't think with your feelings. When there is a relationship problem to be solved, travel up the ladder to the most creative you. You'll soon realize that you create the relationships you have in your life. They don't just happen to you. Number 25. Be where you are. Most of us don't ever focus. We constantly feel a certain amount of psychic chaos because we're always trying to think of too many things at once. Focus on what you want, and it will come into your life. Focus on being a happy and motivated person, and that's who you'll be. Number 26. Act like a hero. We need heroes in our lives. They're not a sign of weakness. They're a source of strength. Bernard Malamud said, Without heroes... We are all plain people, and we don't know how far we can go. Heroes show us what's possible for a human being to accomplish. Therefore, heroes are very useful to anyone interested in self-motivation. You don't have to have just one hero. Choose a number of them. Put their pictures up. Become an expert in their lives. Collect books about them. Let your heroes' lives inspire you. They're only people like we are. What distinguishes them from us is the great levels they've reached in self-motivation. To just passively adore them is to insult our own potential. Instead of looking up to our heroes, it's much more beneficial to look into them. Number 27. Accept your willpower. You know, a lot of people say, I don't have any willpower. But if you think you have no willpower... You're undermining your own success. Everyone has willpower. To be listening to this program, you've got to have willpower. The first step in developing your willpower is to accept its existence. The second step is to know that your willpower, like a muscle in your arm, is yours to develop. You're in charge of making it strong 
or letting it become weak. Willpower is not strengthened by random external circumstances. Willpower is an inside game. Make a promise to yourself to be clear and truthful about your own willpower. It's always there. Number 28. Say no to yourself. A lot of people are afraid of the word discipline. But at the root of the word discipline is the word disciple. When you're self-disciplined, you've simply decided in matters of the will to become your own disciple. Once you make that decision, your life's adventures get more interesting. You start to see yourself as a stronger person. You gain self-respect. Psychologist Abraham Heschel said, Self-respect is the fruit of discipline. The sense of dignity grows with the ability to say no to oneself. Emerson said that when we say no to a temptation, the power of that temptation passes into our willpower. And William James recommended that we do at least two things every day that we don't want to do. By doing this, we stay powerfully aware of our own willpower. Number 29. Make new word connections. If you associate the word willpower with negative things such as harsh self-denial and punishment, you'll weaken your resolve to build it. Now, to increase your resolve, it's really useful to think of new word connections. For example, to weightlifters, failure is success. Unless they lift a weight to a point of failure, their muscles aren't growing. So they've programmed themselves through repetition to use the word failure in a positive sense. Language leads to power. So be conscious of the creative potential of all the language you use and then guide that language in the direction of more personal power. Number 30. Deprogram yourself. If you're a regular consumer of the major news programs, you belong to a very persuasive and hypnotic cult. You need to be deprogrammed. Start by altering how you listen to the media. Program out all the negative, cynical, and skeptical thoughts that you now allow to flow into your mind unchecked when you hear the news. Once you've gotten good at factoring out the negative aspects of the media today, take it a step further. Make your own news. Be your own breaking story. Don't look to the media to tell you what's happening in your life. Be what's happening. Number 31. Open the present. Practice being awake in the present moment. Make the most of your awareness of this moment. Don't live in the past unless you like guilt. Don't live in the future unless you like fear. Just stay focused on today. Watch what happens to your motivation. Number 32. Serve and grow rich. You can motivate yourself by increasing the flow of money into your life. Most people are embarrassed to even think this way. They don't want to think and grow rich because they think they'll be thought of as greedy. Or maybe they still believe in the thoroughly discredited Marxist economic superstition that to make money, you have to take it away from somebody else. Or else they don't want to come across as being obsessed with money. But you know who's really obsessed with money? People who think they don't have enough. They obsess about money all day long. It's in their family discussions. It's in their minds at night. It becomes a destructive part of their relationships during the day. George Bernard Shaw said, Our first duty in life is not to be poor. The road to not being poor always travels through your professional relationships. The more you serve those relationships, the more productive you'll become and the more money you'll make. Allow yourself to link financial well-being with an increased capacity for compassion for others. If I'm living in poverty, how much love and attention can I give my children or to my fellow humans? How much help can I be to others if I'm always worried about being in debt? Number 33. Imitate Columbo. In your professional life, whatever it is, always be curious. When you meet with someone, think of yourself as a bumbling but 
friendly private detective like Colombo was. Ask questions. By asking questions in your relationships, you're already creating the relationship, and you're already self-motivated. You don't have to wait for the other person to make it happen. Number 34. Give away some power. Motivate yourself by giving someone else the ideas necessary for self-motivation. You can have any experience you want in life simply by giving that experience away to someone else. John Lennon called it instant karma. If you want to be motivated, shift your inspiration to someone else. Point out their strengths. Offer encouragement and support. Watch what it does for you. Number 35. Talk to yourself. We've always been a little nervous culturally about talking to ourselves. We associate it with insanity. But Plato said that thinking was the soul talking to itself. There's no one better to talk to than yourself if you really want to get things worked out. No other person has as much information about your problems. No one knows your skills and capabilities better. Nathaniel Brandon suggests that we get our creative thinking going each morning by asking ourselves two questions. One, what's good in my life? And two, what is there still to be done? Because thought always precedes action, talking to yourself is a proven way to get motivated. Number 36. Schedule your comebacks. Progress toward your goals is never going to be a straight line. It'll always be a wavy line. You'll go up and then come down a little. Two steps forward and one step back. Now, most people get discouraged when they slide a step back after the two steps forward. They think they're failing. They think they've lost it. But they really haven't. They're simply in step with the natural rhythm of progress. Now, once you understand this rhythm, you can look ahead on your calendar and block out time to refresh, renew, recover. Schedule your comeback while you're on top. Build in big periods of time to get away, even to get away from what you love, because coming back is going to be that much more exciting when you've been renewed. Number 37. Live your true life. The psychologist David Viscott wrote, When you say you fear death, you're really saying that you fear you've not lived your true life. This fear cloaks the world in silent suffering. How do you know what your true life is? How do you know how to live it? First, find out what makes you happy, and then start doing that. Now, if writing makes you happy and you're not writing for a living, you might want to start up a company newsletter. When I first realized that speaking and teaching made me happy, I started a free weekly workshop. I didn't just wait until something was offered to me. There's no goal better than this one, to know, as you lie in your deathbed, that you lived your true life. You did what it was that made you happy. Number 38. Get up on the right side of the bed. Since I was a child... I've always been intrigued with the idea that you could have a great day just by getting up on the right side of the bed. Today, my fascination is not so much with the right side of the bed as it is with the right side of the head, or, to be more precise, the right side of the brain. In the 1930s, brain surgeons discovered the different functions of the two halves of the brain while working on epileptics. In 1950, Roger W. Sperry made the greatest breakthroughs in discovering that dreams and energy and creative insight come from the right side of the brain. And linear, logical, short-term, and short-sighted thinking came from the left side of the brain. The best explanation for how whole brain thinking surpasses left brain thinking or right brain thinking is in a book written by British philosopher Colin Wilson, called Frankenstein's Castle. Wilson reveals that we have more control over drawing vital energy and creative ideas from the right brain than we ever realized. And what stimulates the right brain the most is a high sense of purpose. 
If you had to carry a heavy sack of sand across town, your left brain might get upset and tell you, well, you're doing something boring and tedious. However, let's say your child were injured. Let's say your little girl were injured badly, and she weighed the same as the huge bag of sand. You'd carry her the same distance to a hospital with a surprising surge of vital energy. That energy would be sent from the right brain. And that's what purpose does to the brain. Self-motivation increases when the left brain gets good at telling the right brain what to do. Number 39. Use your magic machine. Most people wait for an external crisis. Oh, a threatened bankruptcy or an attack on the street or the burning down of their home or an unwanted divorce to finally kick in their whole brain thinking. But you know that leads to a life of reaction rather than creation. The three best ways to activate whole brain thinking are through goal setting, joyful work, and revitalizing play. So rather than wait for some external crisis to appear, you can create an internal challenge of your own. Goals and games. Goals and games motivate you more than anything else in the world. Number 40. Get your stars out. Terry Hill, the New York writer, has been a friend of mine since the sixth grade. And he gives lectures and seminars on creativity. His advice to his audiences on the subject of creativity is from J.D. Salinger, and that is, make sure you get your stars out. And this is another way of saying, let the universe that is in you shine freely. Don't try too hard to force things. Just get your stars out and let them shine. Number 41. Be a finisher. Do you want to know where fatigue really comes from? It doesn't come from working too hard. All the research shows that fatigue comes from not finishing your work. William James once wrote, Nothing is so fatiguing as the hanging on of an uncompleted task. I was giving a self-motivation seminar recently. During one of the breaks, a man came up to me and he said, Hey, you know what? My problem is I never seem to finish anything. I'm always off onto something before anything's completed. He then asked whether I could give him some affirmations that might alter this. So I said, Do you think affirmations are what you need? I mean, if you had to learn to use a computer, could you do it by sitting on your couch and repeating the affirmation, I know how to use a computer. I'm great at using computers. I'm a wizard on a computer. He admitted that affirmations would probably have no effect on his ability to use a computer. So the best way to change your belief system is to change the truth about you, I told him. To believe that you're a good finisher, you've got to build a personal record of finishing tasks. He followed my suggestions, and he followed them with great enthusiasm. He bought a notebook, and at the top of the first page he wrote, Things I've Finished. Each day, he made a point of setting small tasks and finishing them. Whereas in the past, he was inclined to start sweeping his front walk and leave it unfinished when the phone rang. Now, he let the phone ring so he could finish the job and record it in his notebook. The more things he wrote down, the more confident he became that he really was becoming a finisher. Consider how much more permanent his belief change was than if he tried to do it with affirmations. He could have whispered to himself all night long, I am a great finisher, but his right brain would have known better. We motivate ourselves by finishing things. Number 42. Invent games. So whatever it is that you have to do, whether it's a major project at work, a huge cleaning job at home, turning it into a game will always bring you higher levels of energy and motivation. Number 43. Interact. There's a huge difference between active relaxation and passive relaxation. Active relaxation refreshes and restores the mind. It keeps it flexible and toned for thinking. Great thinkers have known this secret for a long time. 
Winston Churchill, for example, used to paint to relax. Albert Einstein played the violin. They could relax one part of the brain while stimulating another. When they returned to workaday pursuits, they were fresher and sharper than ever. Most of us simply deaden the mind in order to relax. We rent mindless videos or read tabloids. We drink, we smoke, we eat until we're foggy and bloated. The problem with this form of relaxation is that it dulls our creativity and it makes it hard to come back into consciousness. But when we find ways to link thinking to recreation, our lives get richer. We become players in the game of life and not just spectators. Number 44. Live a whole life today. John Wooden was the most successful college basketball coach of all time. His UCLA teams won 10 national championships in 12 years. Wooden created a major portion of his coaching and living philosophy from one thought, a single sentence passed on to him by his father when Wooden was a little boy. That thought? Make each day your masterpiece. While other coaches would try to gear their players to some kind of important game in the future, Wooden always focused on today. His practice sessions at UCLA were every bit as important as any championship game. In his philosophy, there was no reason not to make today the proudest day of your life. Today is a microcosm of your entire life. It's your whole life in miniature. You've got eternity in the palm of your hand. Life is now. Life is not later on. And the more we hypnotize ourselves into thinking we have all the time in the world to do what we want to do, the more we sleepwalk and the more we miss life. Number 45. Welcome your problems. Every solution has a problem. You can't have one without the other. So why do we say that we hate problems? Why do we claim to want a hassle-free existence? Deep down, where our wisdom lives, we know that problems are not to be feared. Problems are simply tough games for the athletes of the mind. And true athletes always want to get a game going. If you learn to love the opportunities your problems present, then your motivational energy will always rise. Every solution has a problem. Number 46. Drive a library. One of the greatest opportunities for motivating yourself today lies in the way you use your drive time. With a huge variety of audio tapes now available, you can use your time on the road to educate and motivate yourself at the same time. Maybe that's where you're listening to this tape right now. If we leave what we think about to chance or to an R-rated rock disc jockey, then we lose a large measure of control over our own minds. Audio cassette learning is one of the surest ways to reprogram your subconscious mind. It's one of the best ways to design an action-oriented belief system, the kind you need to inspire ongoing self-motivation. Number 47. Rewind your thoughts. Perhaps you've noted some idea in this program or some recent book you've read that you want to hold on to. Even a single phrase, if you place it prominently in your home or in your office, can have a huge impact on your life. So write things down. Put things up. Write down what motivates you and put it up where you can see it. Number 48. Make yourself up. One of the ways to get started creating goals and action plans is just make them up like you did as a kid. Think of creating in simpler terms than that. Think of it as something that all humans do very easily. The French physician, Emile Coué, said, Always think of what you have to do as easy, and it will be. Number 49. Get small. Most people participating in the free enterprise system have become thoroughly convinced of the power of setting large and specific long-range goals for themselves. 
career goals, yearly goals, and monthly performance goals are always on the mind of a person with ambition. But many people overlook altogether the power of small goals. Goals set during the day that give energy to the day and a sense of achieving a lot of small wins along the way. By increasing your conscious use of small objectives, you'll see the larger objectives coming into reality much faster than you thought they would. Number 50. Get out of the box. All of us tend to look at our challenges from inside a box. We take what we've done in the past and put it in front of our eyes and then try to envision what we call the future. But you see, that restricts our future. With that kind of restricted view, the best the future could possibly be is a new and better past. Great motivational energy occurs when we get out of that box and realize that the possibilities for creative ideas are infinite. To create the best possible future for yourself, don't try to look at it through a box containing your own past. Create the future from nothing. Number 51. Advertise to yourself. Sports psychologist Rod Gilbert says, quote, Losers visualize the penalties of failure and winners visualize the rewards of success. Without advertising our goals to ourselves, we can lose sight of them altogether. Now, I'll often start the day by drawing four circles on a blank piece of paper. The circles represent my day, my month, my year, and my life. Inside each circle, I write down what I want. It can be a dollar figure, it can be anything. And the goals can change from day to day, it doesn't matter. There's no way to get this process wrong. But by writing the goals down, I'm like an airline pilot looking at my map before takeoff. I'm orienting my mind to what I'm up to in life. I'm reminding myself of what I really want. Now, when you get on a plane, I mean, would you poke your head into the cabin and say to the pilot, uh, just take me anywhere? I mean, that's how we live our lives. That's how we live our lives when we don't make a map. Number 52, don't stop thinking. Motivation comes from thought. Everything we do begins with a thought. And when we quit thinking, we lose the motivation to act. We eventually slip into pessimism, and the pessimism leads to even less thinking, and so it goes. A downward spiral of negativity and passivity, feeding on each other. Pessimists think so negatively about doing the whole thing perfectly that they end up doing nothing and becoming passive. Whereas the optimist always does a little something, always takes an action, always feels like progress is being made. Pessimists continually use their imaginations to visualize worst-case scenarios, and then concluding that those scenarios are so hopeless that there's no cause for action. Therefore, pessimism always leads to passivity. Optimists agree with Colin Wilson's point of view. He said, Imagination should be used not to escape from reality, but to create it. Begin the habit in yourself of saying no to negativity. When negative thoughts start their argument in your mind, which they always do, even for optimists, don't stop thinking. Real creative thinking is going to lead to optimism. And optimism is always self-motivating. Number 53. Debate your dark side. Negative thinking is something we all do. The difference between the person who's primarily optimistic and the person who's primarily pessimistic is that the optimist learns to become a good debater. Once you become thoroughly aware of the effectiveness of optimism in your life, you can learn to debate your pessimistic thoughts. If you catch yourself brooding, worrying, thinking pessimistically about an issue, build a case for the optimistic view. Pretend you're an attorney 
whose job it is to prove the pessimist in you is wrong. If you really want to open up your life, go optimistic. Number 54. Make use of trouble. You know, I think all of us have heard so many stories, so many incidents where bad events, looking back, in retrospect, were strokes of great fortune. A person who breaks her leg skiing, meets a doctor in the hospital, falls in love, marries him, has a happy life. What seemed horrible turns out to be unexpectedly great. We begin to see the truth in what Richard Bach says. Every problem carries a gift inside it. Now, by choosing to make use of seemingly bad events, by asking yourself, how can I use this? What might be good about this? You can get to the gift inside your problem a lot more quickly. Number 55. Learn to brainstorm by yourself. So, try this. Put a goal on the top of a page, and then... Put numbers 1 through 20 on that page and begin your brainstorming session. List 20 ideas. They don't have to be well thought out. They don't have to be reasonable. Give yourself permission to flow. Your only objective is to have 20 ideas scrawl down within a certain period of time. If you do this for one week, you'll end up with 100 ideas. Are they all usable? No, of course not. But who cares? When you began the process, you probably didn't have any usable ideas. Number 56. Create your own voice. Uh, there have been times when I've been told that I am lucky to have a good speaking voice. Many people are impressed. Sometimes I don't even use a microphone. I speak to hundreds of people in the audience, boom out to them. And, you know, people will say, boy, you've been blessed with a powerful set of vocal cords. I have to tell you, it's not true. My voice used to be no better than some feeble monotone. It really was really awful. I mean, I would talk like this. Now, yeah, you know, my voice, I would love to see it at eight. Now, look, I set about to change it. I always carry a number of cassettes in my car. I always sing along with them. I crank them up good and loud. By the way, it's best done while you're driving alone. And I sing at the top of my lungs. I make certain I do it every day, even when I don't feel like singing. See, that's the point. Don't let your feelings ruin your life. Keep thinking. Strategize. Plan. You can create anything you want. You can even create your own voice. Number 57 live on the frontier. We've always had a real fascination with America's frontier days. Shows like Little House on the Prairie, movies like Dances with Wolves. I mean, it reflects a real yearning for those adventurous times. Now, what's exciting, what's really exciting about today is that a new frontier is here. The technological explosion, our entry into the information age, have created a situation in which employers are no longer interested in our job histories. At least it's not as much as they used to be. What are they interested in? Right now, our current capabilities. For example, let's say my company is trying to enter the Chinese market to sell its software, and you, at age 70, can speak fluent Chinese, know all about software, and have energy and zest for success, how can I afford not to hire you? Times have changed. This is the new frontier. It's all about what you can do, not about what you've done. Number 58. Replace your habits. Self-motivation is much more difficult to achieve when we're held back mentally by certain bad habits. But here's the catch. Bad habits can't be gotten rid of because they exist for good reasons. They're there to do something for us, even if that something ends up being self-destructive. You see, down deep, even a bad habit is trying to make us operate better. That's why bad habits have to be transformed and built upon. They can't be killed. They can't be eliminated. We have to go to the beneficial impulse that drives the habit and then build on that to make the habit grow from something bad into something good. What we then achieve is habit replacement. Now, where bad habits are concerned, replacement is the only thing that works. I've known people who quit smoking without even intending to. 
Maybe they took up running, some form of aerobic exercise. And soon, the breathing and relaxation they were getting from the exercise made smoking feel so bad to their bodies, they quit. They quit smoking because they'd introduced a replacement. Subconsciously, you don't even think your habit is bad because it's fulfilling a perceived need. So the way to strengthen yourself is to identify the need and build on it. Honor the need by replacing the current habit with one that's healthier and more effective for you. Number 59. Paint your day. Self-motivation is much more difficult to achieve when we're held back mentally by certain bad habits. When you wake up, try picturing your day as a blank artist's canvas. Ask yourself, Who's the artist today? Me or blind circumstance? If you choose to be the artist, how do you want to paint your day? Number 60. Swim laps underwater. When Bobby Fischer prepared for his world championship chess match with Boris Spassky, he prepared by swimming laps underwater every day. He knew that as the chess matches wore on into the late hours, the player with the most oxygen going to his brain would have the mental advantage. So he built his brain by building his lungs. Sometimes all you need is the air that you breathe just to motivate yourself. Going for a run or a walk or simply deep breathing gives the brain the fuel it feeds on and motivation comes easy. Number 61. Get some coaching. After a disappointing round on the golf course, Jack Nicklaus would often take a golf lesson. When I first heard about this, I said to myself, who could give Jack Nicklaus a lesson in golf? But that was before I ever really understood the value of coaching. And then a young business consultant named Steve Hardison taught me something. Nicklaus takes a lesson not because his coach is a better player, but because his coach can stand back from Nicklaus and see his moves objectively. So, if coaching is appropriate for your golf or tennis game, it could also be appropriate for the game of life. Ask someone you admire to be honest with you and coach you for a while. Let them tell you what they see. It's a courageous thing to do, and it'll always lead to growth. Number 62. Leave home. Once when Steve Hardison and I were discussing a few of my old habits that were holding me back from realizing my business goals. I finally said to him, but why? Why do I do those things? I mean, if I know they hold me back, why do I continue to do them? And he said, you do them because they feel like home. When you do those things, you do them because that's what you're comfortable doing. And so you make yourself right at home doing them. As they say, there's no place like home. Home can be an ugly place if it's not kept up and consciously made beautiful. Home can be a dark, damp prison, smelling of bad habits and laziness. But we think we're safe there. However, when we inspect the worn-out house more closely, we can see that the safety we think we're experiencing is pure self-limitation. Now, you might want to identify the habits that keep you trapped. Identify what you've decided is your final personality, for example. Understand that it might be a hasty construction built only to keep you safe from risk and growth. See, once you've done that, you can leave. You can leave home. You can get the blueprints out, and you can create a home you really want. Number 63. Perform rituals. As you listen to these various ways to motivate yourself, you might have noticed that action is often the key. Doing something is what leads to doing something. It's the law of the universe. An object in motion stays in motion. My own ritual for jump-starting the brain is walking. Many times in my life I've had a problem that seems so overwhelming. It seemed too overwhelming to even do anything about. But my ritual is to take the problem out for a long, long walk. Time and time again, during the course of the walks, something comes out of nowhere some idea for an action that would solve the problem. So try making up a ritual for yourself, anything that will act as a self-starter. 
Rituals will have you in action before you feel like getting into action. Rituals always override your built-in laziness. They always get you motivated in a predictable, controllable way. Number 64. Start your life over. If you catch yourself thinking that you're too old to do something you want to do, please recognize that you're now listening to the pessimistic voice inside of you. It's the voice of a liar. Talk back. Remind the voice of all the people in life who started their lives over again at any age they wanted to. John Houseman, the Emmy Award-winning actor in The Paper Chase, he started acting professionally when he was 73 years old. Don't listen to the voice inside. You can start your life over right now. Number 65. Keep all your promises. One way I used to motivate myself was to make some unreasonable promise. To go to someone I cared about, either personally or professionally, and promise something really big. Something that will take all the effort and creativity I had to make it happen. But, you know, there were times when those huge promises I made weren't kept, and I realized over the years it's not really an intelligent way to self-motivate. Today I'll make commitments to other people, but they're commitments that I know I can keep. But to motivate myself, I've replaced promising others with setting goals inside myself. The power of goals is that they can be outrageous, they can be huge, and they can free up really wild possibility thinking. Without setting large goals internally, what I tend to do is just live a life of things that I think I have to do. Number 66. Give some luck away. Basketball coach John Wooden used to say, you cannot live a perfect day without doing something for someone who will never be able to repay you. I agree with that. And there's a way to make sure you can't be repaid. That's doing something for someone who won't even know who did it. Now this gets into a theory I've had all my life. And that is, you can create luck. You can create luck in your life by giving it away. See if you can't begin creating your own luck. Number 67. Draw your universe. If you use my four-minute, four-circle goal-setting system that I talked about earlier, you can create your own goal-directed universe. Try this. After you wake up in the morning, wipe the sleep from your eyes, sit down with a pad of paper, and draw four circles. Now, these are your own planets. Label the first circle lifelong dream. Your lifelong dream might be to save, oh, a half a million dollars for your retirement years. So put that number in your life circle. Then look at the next planet in your solar system, circle two. That circle you're going to label my year. What do you need to save in the next 12 months in order to be on course to hit your life savings goal? Now that you've got your first two circles filled with a number, move to the third circle, my month. What would you have to save each month to hit your year's goal? Then put that number down and go to the final circle, my day. What would you need to do today that if you repeated it every day would ensure a successful month? You can't help but see that each circle, if done successfully, guarantees the success of the next circle. If you hit your daily goal every day, your monthly goal is automatically hit. In fact, you don't even have to worry about it. And if your monthly goal is reached, the yearly goal has to happen. It's mathematical. And if your yearly goals are hit, the lifelong goal cannot not be reached. Then you can see, proven for you, that your life and your day are the same thing. You can create your own universe any way you like. The system itself is not the motivator. Your understanding of your responsibility to be a creative planner that's what the motivator is. Number 68. Get up a game. If you're really interested in motivation, there's nothing more fun than competition. Competition has a bad name these days. It shouldn't. It teaches you the valuable lesson that no matter how good you are, there's always somebody better than you. That's a lesson in humility everybody needs. And it teaches you that by trying to beat somebody else, you reach for more inside of you. Trying to beat somebody else puts the game back into life. And if it's done optimistically, it gives energy to both competitors. 
It teaches sportsmanship. And it gives you a benchmark for measuring your own growth. So in your life, let the games begin. Have fun winning and losing. And when someone has insulted you or underrated you, don't just get even. Get better. Use your victory not to hurt them, but to create you. Number 69. Turn your mother down. In Dr. Martin Seligman's studies of optimism and pessimism, he found out a remarkable fact. We first learn how to explain the world to ourselves from our parents, and more specifically, our mothers. I'm quoting from Dr. Seligman. Young children listen to what their primary caretaker, usually the mother, says about causes, and they tend to make this style their own. If the child has an optimistic mother, this is great, but it can be a disaster for the child if the child has a pessimistic mother. Fortunately, Seligman's studies show that the disaster only needs to be temporary, that optimism can be learned at any age. Now, it's not self-motivating to blame mom if you find yourself to be a pessimist. Blaming someone never self-motivates because... It strengthens the belief that your life is being shaped by forces outside yourself. Love your mom. She learned her pessimism from her mother. But change yourself. Number 70. Face the sun. Helen Keller wrote, When you face the sun, the shadows always fall behind you. This was Helen Keller's poetic way of recommending optimistic thinking. What you look at what you face grows in your life. What you ignore falls behind you. But if you turn and look only at the shadows, they become your life. Number 71. Look inside. Most of us wait to find out who we are from impressions and opinions we get from other people. Oh, do you really think I'm good at that? We ask. Somebody compliments us. If we're persuaded that they're being honest and have made a good case, we might alter our self-image upward. That's great getting feedback from others, especially positive feedback. But your journey should be internal. Travel deeper and deeper inside to find out your own potential. Your potential is your true identity. It only waits for self-motivation to come alive. Number 72. Go to war. Anthony Burgess was 40 when he learned he had a brain tumor that would kill him within a year. He was completely broke, and he didn't have anything to leave behind for his wife, Lynn, who was soon to be a widow. Burgess had never been a professional novelist in the past, but he always knew it was inside him to be a writer. So, for the sole purpose of leaving behind royalties for his wife, he put a piece of paper into the typewriter, and he began writing. He had no certainty that he'd ever even be published, but he couldn't think of anything else to do. Burgess wrote energetically. He finished five and a half novels before that year was through, but he didn't die. His cancer had gone into remission, and then it disappeared altogether. In his long and full life, Anthony Burgess wrote more than 70 books. Without the death sentence from cancer, he might not have written anything. You know, it's funny, but research shows that during times of war, suicide rates go down. We don't have to wait for something tragic. We don't have to wait for a war to attack us from without. We can get the same vitality by challenging ourselves from within. Joan of Arc said, All battles are first won or lost in the mind. A useful exercise for self-motivation might be this. Ask yourself, what would you do if you had Anthony Burgess's original predicament? If I had just a year to live, how would I live differently? What exactly would I do? That question can inspire surprising thoughts. It can reveal skills inside you that you're not using today. Number 73. Make small change. When I first began working on self-motivation a long time ago, I'd go through all kinds of emotional mood swings. I'd get really high on the idea of who I could be. I'd set out to change myself overnight. And then my old habits would pull me right back to who I used to be. Then I'd become demoralized. Later in my life, 
I finally caught on to the idea that great things are often created slowly. Great paintings, great buildings. So why couldn't great people be created slowly? So if you're willing to see yourself as a masterpiece in progress, then you'll love small changes. You'll be excited by a tiny thing you did differently today. If you want a stronger body and you took the stairs instead of the elevator, celebrate. You're moving in the direction of self-creation. Number 74. Do something badly. Sometimes we don't do things because we're not sure we can do them well. We feel we're not in the mood or at the right energy level to do the task we have to, so we put it off or wait for inspiration to arrive. We're so afraid to do things until we're sure we'll do them well, we don't do anything. This is the source of all writer's block, by the way. This tendency led G.K. Chesterton to say, if a thing is worth doing, it's worth doing badly. If you're not motivated to do something you know you need to do, just decide to do it badly. Add a little self-deprecating humor. Be comically bad at what you're doing, and then enjoy what happens to you once you're in the process. Number 75. Be a Visioneer. A few years ago, I began working with motivational speaker and author Dr. Dennis Deaton, and he allowed me to learn and even teach his principles of visioneering, which he defines as engineering dreams into reality by the use of active mental imaging. The principle is this. You can't do anything that you can't picture yourself doing. Visioneering is just another word for picturing yourself. Once you make the picturing process conscious and deliberate, you begin to create the self you want to be. Number 76. Shine your light. Chesterton used to say that taking things lightly was the most spiritually advanced thing you could do to improve your effectiveness in life. After all, said Chesterton, it's because God's angels take themselves so lightly that they're able to fly. And if his angels take themselves that lightly, imagine how much more lightly he takes himself. Your own motivational level will always be lifted with humor. Anytime you're stuck, ask yourself to take things lightly. Ask yourself to come up with some funny solutions. Laughter will destroy all limits to your thinking. When you're laughing... You're open to anything. Number 77. Be a list writer. Never hesitate to sit down with yourself and make lists. The more you write down what it is you want, the more you can dictate your own future. A goal gains power when you write it down, and it gains more power every time you write it down. Now, we're always looking for motivation in what others have written. But if you become a creative list maker... You'll learn how to motivate yourself by what you've written. Number 78. Be the change. Don't try to change other people. It doesn't work. You'll waste your life trying. We talk to our children for hours about how we think they should change. But children don't learn from what we say. They learn from what we do. By being what you want them to be, you can lead by inspiration. What you tell people to do often goes right by them. Who you are doesn't. The change in you is contagious. When you yourself change, watch how the people around you change. Number 79. See the gold. In every circumstance, we can look for the gold or we can look for the filth. And what we look for, we'll find. Opportunities are like those subatomic quantum particles that come into existence only when they're seen by an observer. Your opportunities will multiply when and only when you choose to see them. Number 80. Simplify. The great Green Bay Packer football coach Vince Lombardi was once asked why his world championship team, which had so many multi-talented players, ran such a basic and simple set of plays. It's hard to be aggressive, he answered, when you're confused. When you simplify your life, it gathers energy. Number 81. Pin life down. Recently, I was working with car dealer Henry Brown of Brown & Brown Nissan, which is a nationally celebrated Nissan dealership. And he was telling me a story about his son, 
a high school wrestler. Now, his boy had been getting only fair results in wrestling this year, so Henry went and talked to him, and he learned that he entered each match completely prepared to counter anything his opponent tried. And no matter how gifted Henry's son was at countering moves, countering was still countering. So finally, Henry suggested to his son that he try entering a wrestling match with a plan, a series of moves that he would initiate no matter what his opponent tried. And the boy agreed, and the results were remarkable. He began winning match after match, pinning opponent after opponent. The young wrestler's goal had always been to win. He didn't have a problem setting big goals. But as Nathaniel Brandon says, a goal without an action plan is a daydream. Before any adventure, take time to plan. Let life respond to you. If you're making all the first moves, you'll be surprised at how often you can pin life down. Number 82. Strengthen your purpose. Energy comes from purpose. If the left side of the brain tells the right side that there's a sufficient crisis, the right side sends energy, and sometimes superhuman energy. And that's why there's such a difference between people who set and achieve goals all day and people who just do whatever comes up, whatever they feel like doing. To the first person, there's always added purpose. To the other, there is boredom and confusion, the two greatest robbers of energy. Because we are totally responsible for our own sense of purpose, that also means that we're totally responsible for the energy in our lives. Number 83. Go on a news fast. I first heard the phrase news fast from Dr. Andrew Weil. Now, he actually tells his patients to stop watching the news for a few weeks, and he gets great results. They sleep better, their whole systems are better. Now, my own recommendation for a news fast has to do with self-motivation. If you go for periods of time without listening to or reading the news, you'll notice an upswing in your optimism about life. You'll really feel a lift in energy. Your mind is yours to fill with whatever you want. The more you accept the responsibility of filling it, the easier it'll be to build an optimistic and effective mindset. Number 84. Choose an action. When you find yourself worrying about something, always ask yourself an action question. What can I do about this right now? And then do something. Any small thing. Anything that worries you should be acted on, not just thought about. Even small actions start to chase away your fears and put you back in control of creating what you want. Number 85. Be a thinker. I was doing some seminars for a large office company in Las Vegas, and the president told me something that was really interesting. He said he had basically two kinds of people working for him, the whiners and the thinkers. The whiners were often very smart, dedicated employees who worked long hours, but when they came into the president's office, it was always to complain. And here's what he said. They're great at finding fault with other managers and telling me what's wrong with our systems, but they're a drain on me because they're so negative I end up trying to make them feel better, and after that I'm depressed. Now, the thinkers, on the other hand, had a different way of coming into the office with problems. Here's what he said about them. The thinkers come to me with ideas. They see the same problems that the whiners see, but they've already thought about possible solutions. When you're committed to self-motivation, you'll follow into the realm of the thinker, naturally. You'll be more valuable to your organization and to yourself. Number 86. Choose enjoyment. There's a huge difference between pleasure and enjoyment. And when we're absolutely clear about the difference, we can grow much faster toward who we want to be. What we do for pleasure, for example, routine sex, eating, drinking, all kinds of short-term stuff, that's different than what we do for enjoyment. Enjoyment always involves the use of a skill, and it always involves facing a challenge. Things like sailing, gardening, golfing, any kind of activity like that involving skills meeting a challenge result in enjoyment. People who get clear on the difference begin to know how to consciously put more enjoyment into their lives. Number 87. Read mystery novels. 
The person with the highest IQ ever measured, Marilyn Voss Savant, recommends mystery novels as brain builders. Here's what she says. Not only is this exercise fun, but it's good for you. I'm not talking about violent thrillers or police procedural novels, but instead I'm directing you to those elegant, clue-filled, intelligent mysteries solved by drawing conclusions, not guns." Unquote. Marilyn Voss Savant believes strongly that the brain can be built as surely and as quickly as the muscles of the body. So the next time you feel like curling up with a good mystery, don't feel guilty. You might be doing the most productive thing you've done all day. Number 88. Express your thoughts. Go ahead and feel your feelings. But when it's time to talk, be thoughtful and express your thoughts. Number 89. Use your weaknesses. Make a list of your strengths and your weaknesses on separate pieces of paper. Place the list of strengths somewhere where you'll see it again, because just looking at it will always pick you up. Now, look at your list of so-called weaknesses and study them for a while. Stay with it until you feel no shame or guilt about them. Allow them to become interesting characteristics instead of anything negative. Ask yourself how each characteristic could be useful to you. When Arnold Schwarzenegger became a professional actor, he had a weakness, his thick Austrian accent. It wasn't long, however, before Arnold incorporated his accent into the charm of his action hero persona on the screen, and a former weakness became a strength. His accent became an identifying part of his characters, and people everywhere were imitating it. Now, there isn't anything on your weakness list that can't be a strength for you if you think about it long enough. Number 90. Try becoming your problem. Whatever type of problem you're facing, the most self-motivational exercise I know of is to immediately say to yourself, I'm the problem. Because once you see yourself as the problem, you can see yourself as the solution. By seeing ourselves as victims of our problems, we lose the power to solve them. To activate the power inside ourselves, we need to take only two essential steps. One, own the problem, and two, create the solution. Number 91. Inflate your goal. There is another self-motivator that must be used as an intellectual tool only. Take a certain goal of yours and double it, or triple it, or multiply it by ten, and then ask yourself, quite seriously, what would you have to do to achieve that new goal? Now, I've often used this method for self-motivation with myself. If I have a goal of signing, say, two seminar contracts in the next three weeks, I'll often get out a pad of paper and ask, how would I get ten contracts signed in three weeks? It always puts me at a different level of thinking. And because I'm solving the problem of ten, I always get at least two. Remember, it's just a self-contained game, not a promise to anybody else. But it is a game that's fun to play. Why? Because it works. Number 92. Come to your own rescue. There are two ideas that are contained in the work of psychotherapists Nathaniel and Devers Brandon that have helped me incredibly. Here's the first one. You can't leave a place you've never been. And here's the other one. No one is coming. I used to believe I could run from all my frightening thoughts and beliefs about myself. But all that ever did was create deeper internal fears and conflicts. What I really needed was to get all my fears into the sunshine and demystify them. Once I systematically began to do that, I was able to dismantle the fears like a bomb squad does to a bomb. Acceptance and full consciousness of those fears was the place I'd never been. Once I was in that place, I could leave. Now, the notion that no one's coming was more terrifying. That idea sounded too much like abandonment. Many of us, even as grown-ups, devise very elaborate and subtle variations of the theme, I want my mommy. The Brandons showed me that I could be much happier, 
much more effective if I valued independence and self-responsibility above dependency on someone else. So when you accept the idea that no one's coming, it's actually a very powerful moment because it means that you're enough. You can handle your problems yourself. You can grow. You can get strong. You can generate your own happiness. And paradoxically, from that position of independence, truly great relationships can be built because they're not based on dependency. They're not based on fear. They're based on mutual independence and love. See how much better you are at self-motivation once you've begun to celebrate the news that you're enough. Number 93. Push your own buttons. Motivation never has to be accidental. Any form of motivation. A lot of people like to motivate themselves musically, for example. But you don't have to wait for hours until a certain song comes on the radio that picks up your spirits. You can control what songs you hear. If there's certain songs that always lift you up, create a greatest motivational hits tape for yourself. You've got much more control over your environment than you've ever realized. Learn how to push your own buttons. Number 94. Strengthen your rehearsal. The harder you are on yourself, the easier life is on you. There isn't anything life can challenge you with that you can't challenge yourself with in advance. You can set yourself up to succeed. If you have to make a presentation in front of someone who scares you, you can always rehearse it first in front of someone who scares you more. If you've got something hard to do and you're hesitant to do it, pick out something even harder and do that first. Watch what it does to your self-motivation going into the real challenge. Number 95. Improve your vision. Robert Fritz said, it's not what a vision is, it's what a vision does. So what does your vision do? Does it give you energy? Does it make you smile? When you're tired, does it take you that extra mile? A vision should be judged by these criteria, the criteria of power and effectiveness. In other words, what does it do? What do you want to bring into being? If your vision isn't giving you energy, then picture another one. Keep at it until you develop a vision that's so colorful and so clear it puts you in action just to think about it. Number 96. Build your power base. The more awake you are, the more conscious you are, and the more you pay attention to how your own efforts at self-motivation are succeeding, the more powerful you'll become. Your knowledge of self-motivation is power in and of itself. Respect your knowledge and build on it. Number 97. Link truth to beauty. To me, the best case for honesty is how beautiful it is, how clean and clear it makes the journey from current reality to the dream. Truth leads you to a more confident level in your relationships with others and with yourself. It diminishes fear. It increases your sense of personal mastery. Lies, half-truths, they'll always weigh you down. Whereas truth will clear up your thinking and give you the energy and clarity needed for self-motivation. Number 98. Take no for a question. Ask the universe for what you want. Don't take no for an answer. Take no for a question. When you ask for something and it's denied to you, imagine that the no you heard is really the question, can't you be more creative than that? Never accept no at face value. Let rejection motivate you to get more creative. Number 99. Walk with love and death. Whenever I need to get through something, face something, or create a courageous kind of action plan, I always take long walks. When I walk long and far enough, a solution always appears. I eventually get oriented to the most creative course of action. Andrew Weil in his book Spontaneous Healing says, when you walk, the movement of your limbs is cross-patterned. The right leg and left arm move forward at the same time, then the left leg and right arm. 
This type of movement generates electrical activity in the brain that has a harmonizing influence on the central nervous system, a special benefit of walking that you don't necessarily get from other kinds of exercise. I call it a walk with love because love and fear are opposites. Most people think love and hate are opposites, but they're not. The ultimate creativity occurs from a spirit of love. Love is always creative, and fear is always destructive. And I call it a walk with death, because it's only the acceptance and awareness of my own death that gives my life the clarity it needs to be exciting. Take your own challenges out for a walk. Feel your self-motivation growing inside you. Feel the electricity in your brain. Feel it harmonized with your central nervous system. You'll soon know for a fact that you do have what it takes. You can walk courage into existence. Number 100. Buy yourself flowers. Buy yourself flowers. And every time you look at them, let them remind you of how colorful your future is going to be. How fresh your thoughts are. How easy it is for you to honor yourself. How much power you have to make your environment beautiful and how sweet the smell of the universe can be.